Welcome to the Writing One presentation, How to Cite Sources in Your Paper. In this presentation, I will give you a general overview of this topic, and I will try to point you in the direction of various resources. We will go through some specifics, and that will be helpful, but the best thing you can do is be very familiar with your books, both How to Write Anything, chapters 46 and 47, and the MLA and APA sections in a pocket style manual, because pretty much anything you would need um, you can find there. Outside of a very few occasional extreme situations, um, you can contact me and I'll help you figure it out, but most of what you can find is in these sections. What does it mean to document your sources? That's something that you'll probably see me say on your papers and we've already talked about it in some of our other presentations. So let's get a little bit of a working definition. What it means to document your sources is to list your sources and note where and how you use them. And there are two places where you're going to document your sources. One is within the text of your paper itself and that's called an in-text citation. To cite something means to reference something, so a citation is a reference. And then you're also going to document your sources at the end of your paper in a list. The general term for that is bibliography. You've probably seen bibliography at the end of these lessons. I tell where I got all my information. And then you also are going to have a different name for it depending on which documentation style you get into. Um, which documentation styles you use are going to depend on the academic field. In general, for English classes across the board, we use MLA, and that's pretty standard throughout many of the humanities types of classes, which is going to be English and things like that. In other fields and in other classes while you're at college, you may end up using another documentation style. The only other one that's really going to get used at Ancilla College is APA. So in this course, we're going to focus on MLA and APA, but be aware that there are other documentation styles out there. So why do we document or cite our sources? Well, we've already talked about plagiarism in another lesson, and um, we've put avoiding plagiarism in the title of a couple of different lessons because it's an important concept and it's something that you may need to go back to. A lot of students plagiarize without realizing it, and so we ask them to go back and cover those lessons again to make sure that they understand and, and can practice that. So. That's one reason that we want to document or cite our sources is because it avoids plagiarism. It avoids accidentally, in many cases, um, borrowing people's ideas and words without giving them credit. And that's what we want to do. We want to give credit to the original sources. We also want to document or cite our sources so that we can identify our sources to our readers as credible and reliable. And we've talked about that as well, the importance of having credible, reliable sources. This helps you show your readers that you have that. It provides evidence for your claims. Anybody can make anything up. We can just stick something in our papers that we made up and we think it sounds pretty educated and smart, but just because it's in there doesn't mean that it's true. And so by documenting or setting our sources, it provides evidence that our claims are true and, and it helps us support our ideas. And then also it helps uh, readers to follow the research and read more if interested. And many readers, believe it or not, will want to read more about the things that we write about. So maybe your four or five page paper are just the beginning of the journey for somebody to learn more about something. And I know many of the articles that I've read, they've gotten me interested and I've gone to find more information about them. And I find a lot of the papers that you write very interesting, believe it or not. And I'd like to read more about that. So that's why we document or cite sources to help our readers learn more. Which should you use as we go along in this class? Well, you can use either MLA or APA, as I said. MLA is a standard for most English comp and other classes at Ensil and other schools. So if you're not sure which one to use, you're not really sure which field you're going into, probably MLA is just the way to go. If you are going into nursing especially, or education, or some other fields like that, um, obviously if you're going into behavioral science fields, you should probably focus on APA. Some students like to learn both just because they're going to need both in college, and so they might do one paper in APA, another paper in MLA, and get a good sense of both. That's what I recommend. Let's talk about in-text citations. The first time you use a source in your papers, you want to use the author's name as you introduce the source. We've talked about that in another lesson. The important thing to do here is to make sure that your readers see that there's some credibility, and you also don't want to just drop a quote in there. So you're introducing the source, and then after you use the source, after you summarize or paraphrase or quote, include more information in parentheses, and that's going to be your in-text citation. 
and you don't just pick random information to choose. What you put in there depends on your documentation style and your type of a source. And you can see on the screen I've put the page numbers for where the books tell you all the different types of information you need about what information goes in there for those in-text citations. Let's talk about the differences between MLA and APA in-text citations. They're somewhat similar, but we do have a couple of differences. So those differences show up in how we do the author's name and including the date of publication. APA is going to include that, MLA won't. We'll see some examples in a minute. The way you do page numbers is slightly different, and then the verb tense and signal phrases is somewhat different too. I'm not going to focus on that quite as much in this course, but I'm just putting that out there so you're aware of it. Let's look at an example here. The first example is an MLA in-text citation, and then the second one is an APA one. And first we see, of course, they do include the author's name, Brandon Conran argues that the story is written from, and then we have our little piece of a quote, a bifocal point of view, and we see the quote is in quotation marks as we would expect, and then after the quotation marks, but note before the period, we're going to see the page number, 111, and if it were from more than one page, we would see 111 through 113 or whatever it is. So we can see that's basically how an MLA one will look. Now, when you have used that source already and maybe you're adding another line from later on um, you would either put Conran in parentheses with the page number or if you're adding that information and you haven't used any sources between the first time you used it and the second time you used it and so on uh, you don't even need that last name in there you would just put the page number in there with the APA in text citation maybe you've looked already and seen some of the differences you can see that they put the year of their research after the author's name. So they say, as researchers, Yanovsky and Yanovsky, and then they have the year 2002, that's when their research came out, have explained obesity was once considered, and then, again, like a good author here, this person has introduced the authors and then done some paraphrasing and then bringing in an exact quote. And we see after the quote, again, after the quotation mark but before the period we see the page number and in this case with the APA they put P period for page 592. So those are some differences there. Let's talk about some of the most common situations that happen for students in writing one and sometimes writing two that I'm often asked about as a professor. First of all students often will ask what about sources without page numbers and this is a real situation especially with sources that you find on a web, on the web a lot of times on the web you're not going to find those page numbers so first of all don't sweat it if they're not in there then obviously you don't have page numbers to put into your citation so don't sweat it however you do need to make sure that you're not missing the page numbers especially when using periodical databases like EBSCOhost, Gales Engage and some of those you actually are looking at articles they do have page numbers because they have originally been published um, whether in digital format or in a hard copy format, they do include page numbers, and those page numbers are included so researchers can use them and find specific information later. Sometimes students assume that because they did find something using an electronic device on the web, um, especially those periodical databases, they assume, well, it was on the web, so of course it doesn't have page numbers, when in fact it does. So go back and check for those. The other issue that comes up is web sources with no specific author. And again, this is something that's happening a lot when we find information. Sometimes we think we find pretty good information, but we can't find an author. Well, one thing to look for is, is the author actually an organization? We would call that a corporate author. Again, you can find those in the sections of the books that we've uh, referenced already. And you can find some examples. So for example, the American Heart Association, or Ancilla College for that matter, or um, the Chicago Cubs, or any, any organization might put something out. Um, a lot of times when students are doing papers, for example, on um, drug use in Indiana, they might use the Indiana State Police website. Well, there's no author listed with that, but it's the Indiana State Police that puts that information out there, so the Indiana State Police is considered the author. The other question you want to ask, if you cannot find a specific author, 
and you definitely can't find an organization that you can label as the author, you need to ask yourself, is the source actually credible? If no person or organization is willing to put an actual name up with the information, then it probably can't be seen as credible. You might agree with it, you might think it would be really good in your paper, but you need to go find another way to find that information where you can find a credible author that you can prove the author is credible to associate and to credit for that information. Um, if on occasion you do find something and you want to use it and you feel like it would be appropriate for your paper but there's absolutely no author, what you do is um, instead of the author name in your citation space, um, you would use the article name in quotation marks um, and put that in, then in parentheses um, after the use of the source so that it is documented there. And that would be when you get to your Works Cited page um, in MLA. That is how the listing would start is with the article name. Now remember, how you cite your sources in your text depends on what type of source it is and what information is available. Sometimes the page number is not available. Uh, sometimes you're going to have more than one author. Sometimes you'll have a corporate author. There are a lot of different variables there. And you're going to want to use your handbook to find the right way. Again, the MLA standard is last name plus page number. But again, you're going to have times where maybe you can't find a page number for a web source. What do you do then? look it up in your handbook rather than have you go through and memorize a whole bunch of different ways you should just know how to use your handbook a key concept here to keep in mind is that the most important skill in citing sources is not memorization and we just ran through a whole bunch of examples because I wanted you to be able to see how to identify those different elements but you don't need to memorize how to do a citation that's way too time consuming I don't have the kind of memory for that I'm sure you don't so we just need to know that what matters most is your ability to use our handbook, our writer's reference book, and find out how to document a particular source. I'm going to share then a brief list of where you can find some help for citing your sources. One of course is your textbooks, we've discussed that and you have that information. Both EBSCOhost and Gale Cengage, our periodical databases, provide automatic citation tools. So learn how to use those if you want some help with those, of course. Um, ask me and I'll try to help with that. The library can help you. Um, I also recommend using the Purdue OWL Online Writing Lab. They have tons of great resources for both MLA and APA. Of course our Insula College Writing Lab. Um, your course instructor, again, ask me anything. I'm, I'm happy to help. Um, I love a good mystery. Once in a while we'll get a really crazy situation where you want to use something as a source and there's a legit use for it. Um, I love tracking down a good mystery, so never hesitate to contact me. Um, and then sometimes students ask about, well, what about easybib.com and other similar site sites? And yes, I like little word games here. Um, easybib.com, I have no problem with using that. In fact, I think it can be a very helpful tool. I've worked with students to use that before. Um, I think it's really nice. I think MLA on there is free, last I checked. Um, APA, I think maybe you get a sample, I'm not sure. Um, they change it from time to time, but I think they might charge you for APA use. But EasyBib can work, but the information it spits out as a piece of software is only as good as the information you put in. So be careful with that. Make sure you're putting the correct information in. Now that you've worked through this lesson and, and looked through and, and hopefully learned how to at least identify some of the popular uh, and common citation questions that you might have, um, you can work through the practice activity documenting sources and see how you do with that. Um, of course, your real test here is going to be using this knowledge and your developing documentation skills as you start working on your major projects. And this is going to be something that you have to do for every paper. So just get used to doing it, get used to asking for help as you need it, and it does get easier as you get more practice.